This section gives us um, some mathematical background for the shapes of atomic orbitals. And I'm gonna go over this kind of quickly. Just hopefully what I, I want you to get out of this is like, oh yeah, yeah, there's, there's math behind that, okay? And if you don't get the math, this is completely fine. I don't claim to understand this math, okay? It's just kind of out there. So we had talked about, oh, I shouldn't have gone, shouldn't have even tried to do this. This uh, Schrodinger's equation, okay? Schrodinger's equation lets us calculate the probability of finding an electron in a particular location. And we, when we get solutions to this equation, we get wave functions. That was a lot of work for nothing. So that wave function squared is called the probability density, the probability of finding an electron at a point in space. Um, the s orbital is spherical, and so the probability density then decreases as the distance from the nucleus increases. So this doesn't really work. Um, and yeah. Anyway, the, um, the plot of these resembles a multiple exposure photograph. Like you took a picture and the electrons, that dot. You take the a picture a second later and the electrons in a different spot. And so you get all these dots, right? What's important to realize is the electron is not moving around the nucleus like a moth around a flame. That was my picture of it for a long time, you know, just zigzagging, jigjagging all over the place, right? That's not what it's doing. But the electron is kind of all over the place. In a sense, its, it's location is spread out over the entire volume of the orbital because it's a lot like a standing wave. And we'll get to that. So this would be what the, the plot looks like. Um, but this is misleading because it has the highest probability of finding the electron at the nucleus, which is one place we know it isn't. So we need something a little bit more here. So they use the radial distribution function. The total probability of finding an electron within a thin spherical shell at a distance r from the nucleus. Okay, that sounds like calculus, doesn't it? What happens here is we've got this one trend with high probability at the nucleus and this other trend with zero probability at the nucleus and you multiply them together and you get something that works better. So the radial distribution gives us zero probability at the, um, at the nucleus. It increases um, as you go away to a maximum at 52.9 picometers from the nucleus, and then it drops off again. This radius is the same radius predicted by Bohr's model of the atom. So that's encouraging. But there's a very important conceptual distance in difference. In Bohr's model, that is the, the uh, radius of the orbit, right? The electron is going in a circular orbit around the nucleus. Very nice and understandable. In quantum mechanics, this is just the most likely distance to find the electron from the nucleus. It's not where it absolutely is because it's often a little further away. You go way out here, it is almost zero, and here it's zero. So this is the most likely distance So the, um, all s orbitals are spherical, and s does not stand for spherical, but it works, right? So s is spherical. The, the larger the, this principal quantum number, the bigger the orbital. And that's kind of like uh, Bohr's uh, orbits. They got bigger and bigger, one, two, three, four, right? After the first one, we have nodes, okay? So a node is a place in a standing wave where the wave function goes through zero. So this is an illustration 
of a standing wave on a piece of string. And what happens is there's a wave going this way and then it bounces and it comes back this way and they constructively interfere here, 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 and here, and they destructively interfere there. They cancel each other out, okay? Uh, yesterday, I surveyed the class and a number of people were not familiar with standing waves and so we're gonna look at this video so that we can understand a little, what this picture is trying to tell us. Hopefully this will work. So at regular speed, it's like a blur. So right? here we have what's called the second harmonic. It's the second possibility for a standing wave for a string that's held at both ends. Because notice this is a node, this is a node, and the middle's a node. So we have three nodes for this wave. Now, like I said, second harmonic, well, what's the first one? The first one will be half this number, so 8.5. So that would be like the 1s orbital that does not have a node in the and middle. And there we go. There's just one wave. So where the amplitude is high, you could think that's where there's more likely to be electron being. Now, I can put this wave in the middle. All of the other harmonics are multiples of this number. So we just saw that two times this number was the second harmonic second possibility. Well, if I go three times this number, I should get the third harmonic. Well, three times 8.5, I guess the way back to 25.5. So that'd go. be like the 3s orbital. It has two nodes in it. So that's the third harmonic. How many wavelengths is this? Well, it's one and a half. Okay, we don't need to really see the rest of that. Oh, we don't want to see that either. Okay. So I think the best way to try to think about what these orbitals are is that they are like a standing wave, like that standing wave on a string. But you know this is two-dimensional and the orbital is three-dimensional, right? So imagine that this is the nucleus and this somehow is spread out in all three dimensions. But that's, that's the S orbital. And the, the 2S orbital would include these pieces and so there would be a node in the middle. The 3S orbital is gonna have two, two nodes, okay? because it's basically a harmonic of that wave function. Any questions? And when you think about the string, you know, it, it blurs as it moves because we, our eyes can't keep up with it. 
And so in essence, you can say, well, the string is everywhere in this area, right? But if you stop it, if you take a picture of it, you see that it's at, an, at one place. So it's a little bit like the electron behaves, right? The standing wave, the electron as a wave, is all over the whole thing. But if you take a picture of it, you force it to become a particle, and it has to be in one location. So these would be the 2s and the 3s orbitals. So this white area is the node. And if we look at the radial distribution, um, we're going to see there's, there's a bit in here. That would be like the first part of the wave. And here's the second part of the wave. And then 3s is going to have two nodes. So this would be like the third harmonic of that standing wave on the string. So every principal energy level has one s orbital. And those are always going to be the lowest energy orbitals in that level. They're spherical, and they, they have nodes after you get past 1s. So those are the orbitals when l equals 0. When l equals 1, we call these p orbitals. And so when l equals 1, then we can have three possibilities for the orientation. So we're going to have three p orbitals. They're going to be aligned around the um, x, y, and z axis. So there's one on the x axis, one on the y axis, and one on the z axis. They're perpendicular to each other. And their radial distribution is going to look like this. They're going to bulge out like that. And so um, this would be like the multiple exposure. Uh, those are kind of hard to look at. So oftentimes, we'll draw them as a solid surface. It's important to understand the electron is not contained in this balloon, right? It's also not zipping around on the surface of that balloon. This is just roughly the shape of where the standing wave that is the electron is, OK? When we go up to L equals 2, now we've got five possible d orbitals. Okay, so that's the minus 2 through plus 1. And these are arranged, again, different ways in space. Um, these are weird, weirder than the P. So the first four, not, not so terribly strange. It's like, okay, well, that's just sort of like a double P orbital, right? And they're just, you know, kind of wonky in space. It's okay. And then there's this guy. What? Yeah just very weird. The great thing is you don't need to remember the shapes of the d orbitals, okay? But they do have nodes. They all have a node at the nucleus, and they also have a node like in this plane and in that plane. Then we get up to L equals 3. Now there's seven orbitals, seven f orbitals. And guess what? These look even weirder like strange balloon art, right? Yeah, look at those guys. Nice. So those orbitals are determined from mathematical wave functions, OK? A wave function can have a positive value or a negative value. It can be above that zero line or below, right? And so the sign of the wave function is called its phase. It can, and you can have waves interacting in phase or out of phase. And this will be important when we talk about valence bond theory and how bonds form by the overlap of these orbitals. So a 1s orbital is just like the first harmonic, right? There's no node. And so this is either positive phase or negative. The p orbital is like, um, looks like it has uh, is the second harmonic. And so one of these lobes is positive and one is negative. And you know, obviously, it gets a lot more complicated after that. But that's the basic idea. So we've got all these strange balloon shapes. So how does that make for a spherical atom? Well, all of these orbitals are superimposed on top of each other, which if they were solid things or containers would be impossible. But what they are 
is they are wave functions that are just overlapping with each other. It's not a string, it's this particle that is a wave, and so they can coexist and just be on top of each other. And you put all of those together, and they add up to basically a spherical atom. Any questions?